So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Uh, just a few verses, so let's all read together in one voice. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Let's read together. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's ask God's blessing one more time. Father, Lord, we stand before your truth and your word, holy, inerrant, and sufficient. And I pray, O oh God, that as we listen to your holy scriptures, I pray that it will be you directly speaking uh, through your word. And I pray that as we heed and as we submit, I pray that you would not only change us, but I pray that we would love you more and love one another as a result of it. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> So once again, I've titled this series uh, Sojourners, as Sojourners, because they lived a lifestyle traveling, as a traveler traveling through, sojourning through this world. So as Brother Dale has prayed, uh, the church is called out, right? Uh, people belonging to a church, by definition, we're called out people out of this world that is set on a path that is leading home, eternal home with God. So we're just traveling through this world. And Peter is writing to such people at that time. But just because they were scattered and persecuted people living as elect sojourners, it didn't mean that they were just simply passing through. According to a lot of historical and sociological records, and also including the Bible, Christians in the first century, early century, second and third centuries, they lived a radical life. They all lived radical lives, leaving a profound impact on the society, in the countries that they were living in. So even though they were called, even though Paul, uh, Peter is addressing them as elect sojourners, He's not addressing them as just simply people passing through who are just there temporarily, just paying rent and just living life there. But he is writing and he is calling them to live a radical life, making a profound impact to all people that they were living with. And most of the times they were uh, Gentiles and foreigners. Their radical living is most clearly recorded in the response of the early epidemic that they experienced in the Roman Empire in the first century, early centuries. And I read about uh, such early Christians' response to the epidemics in light of the pandemic that we were experiencing uh, recently. But there were two major epidemics that lasted for decades in the second and third centuries in the Roman Greco, uh, Greco-Roman Empire at that time, which devastated the population. But not only the population, you can imagine devastating the economy, just like it has affected us so profoundly, and the empire itself, militarily, like socially, everything was devastated because of major epidemics that lasted for dec decades, millions of people losing their lives. And it is recorded at some points, uh, they had like 2,000 people dying in a single day. And you can't imagine densely populated cities like Rome and other uh, great cities with lack of knowledge of hygiene and microbiology and things like that and lack of vaccinations and medicines and care. Uh, the medical advances that we have, they didn't have anything. So you can imagine the impact. And many Romans considered epidemics as a religious punishment, right? So they, what they did was they would appease their gods and they would uh, offer sacrifices and they would offer worship services unto their gods so that this epidemic would pass away. And oftentimes the Christians who would not join in with them in those um, 
services, appeasement services, they were to be blamed. Romans blamed them uh, for what has happened, and they were greatly persecuted by the people. And they were simply scapegoats for angry and uh, frustrated Romans. Right? They, had, they needed somebody to blame. Right? Uh, Nero blamed the Christians for the fire, and they were all about, hey man, those people are foreigners living here and living in a different lifestyle, worshiping a different God. It must be because of them all this is happening. Or they were just venting their frustrations and anger at them. So they were greatly, greatly persecuted during the second and the third century. These were perhaps enough reasons to snuff out Christianity in the early stages. Right? Severe epidemic and a severe um, persecution at the time. But the church flourished and the Christianity began or became even stronger and the church grew even larger uh, during this time. It is because the Christians during the time were radically different than other pagan neighbors. It's really odd when you think about it, right? It was a perfect scenario for Christianity to die out, and yet it was during this time it flourished, and many people wrote about the early Christians in the early centuries, including many non-Christian writers. While everybody, almost everybody left the infested cities, Many Christians stayed and cared for the sick. Regardless of their religion, regardless whether they were Christians or not, they stayed and stayed put to care for the sick, even though that would mean that many of them would die as a result of staying back and caring for the sick themselves. And also when they were persecuted, Christians were so radically different than the neighboring pagan uh, neighbors in a way that they did not retaliate in hate or in violence. But many died praying for them, just like Jesus has told them to, right? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And all those are written in the early records. And my question was, why were they so different? Why was it that they lived such radical lives that are so almost opposing to the rest of the world we're living in, right? When there's a sickness, they flee to save themselves. And when they see other people who are in, in sickness, uh, you wouldn't really help because you are risking yourselves of the same disease and whatnot. And also, when they're persecuted, you also want to come back with a plan to retaliate or get even. But these people are very, very different. Why were they so different? And how were they so radically different in a way that changed everything, that may allowed Christianity to flourish in such grave circumstances? And if I may direct the same question to all of us this morning, how are we as Christians living today in our society? How different are we in terms of our goals than the rest of the world, the values that we hold, the way that we live? How different are we? How radically separate are we than the rest of the world? Or are we living in the same way, in the same manner, in the same speech, in the same relationships, and in the same values? Well, the early Christians were profoundly different because they lived with a clear conviction. A clear conviction. A conviction for what? Conviction for what? That, that have changed them so radically. It was their clear conviction about none other than the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is what he says in verses 1 and on. It's, he says, so this is Paul speaking this time. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I believed to you, uh, delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, 
Who is Cephas? Cephas? Our author Peter. Thank you. Our author Peter, who appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So what made the early Christians so radically different? What made them live in a way that empowered them despite of grave, grave circumstances? Grave epidemics and grave persecutions. How was it that they were able to maintain their faith in such a way that not only the, the fire that God has given them was snuffed out, but it caught on fire like a wildfire in the forest that spread? According to Paul, it's because they were all eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus Christ. First of all, the resurrected Jesus appeared to Peter, our author, then to the twelve, then to thousands of eyewitnesses, including that one occurrence where he has shown himself to 500 people at one time. And then he stayed with them for 40 days, teaching, eating, uh, learning, growing, sharing together. And then to Paul. I mean, can you imagine if you have witnessed a man who has died, Peter, especially our author, he was the very first one to be there when Christ died. And he was the first one to be there when he was buried. He was the first one to be there when he was uh, lying in, in the grave. And he was the first, well, one of the first ones to be there when Jesus rose again. He ran to Jesus. He saw it all. If you have seen it with your own eyes, knowing that this is not some fabricated story or some fable or some hoax, your lives would change, wouldn't it? If you have witnessed your teacher who you have followed, and Peter probably had some idea who Jesus was while he was with Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry, but he had no clue. He didn't know the full extent that he would understand when Jesus rose again from the dead. And after he ascended back to heaven, he is fully convinced that this man is no just a great teacher. He's not some prophet. But everybody, thousands of eyewitnesses were fully assured. And Paul is writing, as he is writing this letter to the church in Corinth, many of the eyewitnesses are still alive with us today. Imagine the impact. Imagine the change that would bring about. And that hope of resurrection, we just celebrated Easter uh, Resurrection Sunday last Sunday, so I hope that this means more to us uh, today. That resurrection, the power of that resurrection that they have witnessed in the power of Jesus Christ is also theirs as they were taught. Right? You too, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you too will live. Even though you die, you will not die forever. You will not stay dead forever, but you will live again. That was a conviction that they were living by. So regardless of what happened, regardless of what was going down in the world, they were true and they were faithful to the calling that they were given by God to care for one another, to help the sick, and to share the gospel, to show the love, and when they're persecuted, you pray for them. Why? Because they were living by the imperishable things and not by the perishable ways of the world. All the people fleed because they were just so full and they were so consumed by the perishable ways of the world not the early Christians. They were living by something else. Something that is imperishable because why? They saw their Lord 
He is imperishable. Amen? He died, but he did not perish. He rose again, and he lives. And then with that gospel, he proclaimed by saying, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son. And all those who believe in him would not, what? Would not perish, but have eternal life. So it's an invitation to a life of the imperishable. But not only then when we get to heaven, not, not only then when we are joined, when we will join with God for eternity, but even now, we can live according to the imperishable ways of God, living in the perishable world. So for this, Peter uh, was now by this time he was writing this letter, he is fully convinced of the power of Jesus Christ. And now he is charging the Christians who are scattered for their faith to do what? To live by the imperishable things. And he offers to us, I don't know if you've caught in the earlier uh, weeks, he offers three imperishable things to live by in the first chapter. First chapter. So as elect sojourners, we too must live by the imperishable things Peter is mentioning to us. And here are the three things. First of all, going back to verses 3 through 5, you must live with the imperishable inheritance, which allows us to live with hope. So this is a little recap of chapter 1 as we are finishing off the first chapter. Let's read verses 3 through 5. Let's read together. Ready, set, go. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So he is calling the Christians to live by this imperishable element, and that is imperishable inheritance. Live with this hope. Even though we may not have all things, even though our, our possessions are lost under the epidemic, under the fire, under the persecution, there is an imperishable inheritance that is kept for you by God's power. It is being guarded by God until we receive them. And that is why we can live in a living hope, says Peter. And how is that granted to us? Through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this guy, Peter, his life is turned upside down. His eye is now just covered with what he has seen, the amazing uh, just picture of what he has seen. His beloved Savior coming back to life, dying and then coming back to life, and then eating with Him and teaching, with, teaching Him, and then going back into heaven. He has witnessed it all, and He is saying, in that power, I want you to be reminded that He is ensuring you, guaranteeing you this inheritance that is imperishable. So this inheritance allows us to hope, live in hope, because this inheritance is unfading in quality. Quality, right? He says it's not only imperishable, it is undefiled and unfading. Meaning that quality is not going to go away. That fullness of God, that whatever the most joyful thing that you're going to be experiencing, that's not going to fade away over time. It's imperishable. Second imperishable that we have uh, witnessed, which was... Uh, two weeks ago, you must live with the imperishable blood of Jesus Christ, which allows us to live in faith. Let's read uh, verses 17 through 19 together. 17 through 19 together. Ready, set, go. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed with the fut from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, 
not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The word imperishable is not there, but he says you're not ransomed with the perishable things such as silver or gold, but with, I mean, it's inferred, imperishable and precious blood of Jesus Christ. This is your new identity, says Peter. You are saved. You are ransomed. You are redeemed from this futile world. Not by the perishable things like gold or silver, but by the payment. The payment that Jesus has paid for us, which is imperishable, which is his blood. So imperishable blood of Jesus Christ here is unfading in value. Unfading in value, which now allows us to live by faith for God. So it is the blood that he has shed for us that has allowed us to live as children of God, right? Sons of obedience, Peter calls us. And we call our God, Abba, Father, he says. And if you are calling God your Father, live in such a way because you are now ransomed, redeemed by the imperishable blood of Jesus Christ that is unfading in value. And lastly, in today's passage, I mean, isn't it cool? He is kind of having the theme of imperishable. Three things. And the last thing he says this morning, you must live with the imperishable word of God, which propels us to live with love. Live with love. Let's read verses 22 and 23 once again. Ready, set, go. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So Peter says, first, first off, you must live remembering where your inheritance lies. Where your inheritance lies. It lied in an imperishable state with God. So we must continue to live with an imperishable hope, even though the world may be in turmoil. And then he calls us to live remembering what we're redeemed with. Right? What we're redeemed from, or where we're redeemed from, and what we're redeemed with. And that is not with the perishable silver or gold, but with the imperishable payment of the blood of Jesus Christ, which gives us infinite value and infinite life. He has made us his children, and he has made us heirs. And then finally, he charges us, telling us that we must live remembering that we're born again, not of perishable seed. So he's calling a seed out, but of imperishable seed, which is through the living and abiding word of God. So the seed, he, call, he brings up seed to mind. He is telling us seed is the beginning of life. Whatever that you plant, if you plant a seed, that seed germinates and seed becomes a plant and a tree and it bears fruit. So that germination, that seed is planted and that is an imperishable seed which is done through what? The living and the abiding word of God. So here, imperishable here, the third time, it is unfading in life life-giving attribute of the word. So first off, the word of God is eternal. And that is why Peter in verse 24, he says, all flesh is like grass and all of its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. It is imperishable because it will remain forever. And we see from Matthew's gospel, that Jesus has taught several occasions in the imperishability of the word of God. Verse 4, when he was tempted by the devil, he says, 
It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then chapter 5, as he is preaching the Sermon, of the, sermon on the Mount, he, he teaches by saying he came to fulfill the law. And this is what he said. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a yoda, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So he is comparing the perishable world versus the imperishable word of God. Everything will pass away, even heaven and an earth. But the word of God will not pass away until a single comma, a single dot, a single smallest letter will be fulfilled. And Jesus says, I have come to fulfill that. And then chapter 24, as he is teaching the disciples about the end times, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But the word of God is not only imperishable because it's eternal, but it is also imperishable because it is the source that gives life. It is the thing that gives life. Right? So if it's the very source of life, it will not lose life. Right? That's common sense. So God, how, how is God's word the source of life? Consider creation. He has caused all things into existence through his word. Through his word. And then consider uh, Ezekiel's vision in the valley. Dry bones coming back, coming alive as soldiers for God because the word of God was proclaimed. And John Wycliffe, uh, this is what he said about God's word. He says, the Bible is God's voice speaking to us. Just as truly as if we heard it, not heard it, heard it uh, audibly, audibly. Just as we have heard it audibly, this is God's voice speaking to us directly. And then that is why uh, Jesus continued to, uh, continue to teach in this way in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 verse 63, it says, Jesus speaking, he says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and what? And life. And then with that teaching, Simon Peter confesses this way. Lord, to whom shall we go to? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter is saying, the, the same guy who has confessed the very same words, right? We have, as sojourners of God, we have to live according to what is imperishable. Not living for what is perishable. Not for money, not for fame, not for comfort, not for health, not for relationships. All that will fade away. Although those things are important things and valuable things here in this life. We must cherish them. We must value them. But that cannot be what drives us each day. That cannot be the motivating factor in, in causing us to live a life as elect sojourners here. It must be the perishable, imperishable, I mean, that we must live by. And Peter is saying we must live according to what gives us life, what will never change, and that is the word of God. You and I change constantly. We may be walking with God faithfully one day, and the next day we may not so much. It may be dependent on what we go through, what we're experiencing, or what we have ex uh, experienced in the past. Maybe perhaps past hurts or past experiences may influence how we live each day. If you had a bad day, maybe you're not really up for bringing God glory today because you started your day wrong. We are like grass, according to Peter. Our flowers fade and wither and fall. But it is the word of God that is unchanging and that is imperishable and that continues to give life. And that is why we must rally our lives according to what is imperishable and unchanging and that is the word of God. We must use our experiences, definitely, 
God used human authors to pen his revelation. We must partner with him. However, what truly boils down to as our ultimate authority and our ultimate guide and our ultimate authority and, and our standard is what is imperishable, that is living, and that is abiding word of God. And that is why Paul was teaching Timothy in this way. Second Timothy chapter 3, he says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystria, which um, persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof, correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So Paul is inviting Timothy, as he himself has given himself to the word of God, as he has lived each moment according to what was given to him, and as he was teaching Timothy to do so, he is inviting him to follow him, so that what? He could also live according to the word that is profitable in equipping each and every one of us. And then not only he taught Timothy, he taught the church in Colossae. In Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thank thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then he also taught the church in Ephesus. Ephesians 6, 17, he says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So Paul is saying, you know, this is the spiritual battleground. And we cannot take on the spiritual warfare without the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We must carry it daily. We must live by it daily. We must free from it daily. And later in chapter 2, soon after, Peter will say, Now drink from the pure milk, which is the word of God. He is encouraging the Christians to live according to the imperishable word of God. It would be foolish for a married man to say, Because I married my wife, I know how she looks and I know how she sounds. I don't need to hear from her again, right? The very way of staying married is being, continuing to see her and continuing to hearing from her and growing together as a married couple. That's the true union. That's the true meaning of marriage. Or if you are into basketball, it's like Kobe Bryant. Although he was a top NBA player, right? There was no one better at that time, I guess, Debatable, but even though he mastered the game, according to him, he trained eight hours a day every day. Okay, this is a quote. I trained eight hours a day every day. That's a thousand made shots per day. Right? Even though he has mastered the game, he went into the gym every single day shooting hoops, thousand made shots a day going over the basics over and over and over and over again so that in that muscle memory, when, when push becomes shove, he knows how to make that shot when people are bumping and people are trying to block him. Right? There's no mastery, nor there is no mystery even. Right? This is how we sojourn with God. We dwell in the word of God richly, daily, like staying married and getting married not, is not the goal, but sojourning together is. And Peter said, this word is the good news that he has preached to you. 
And I would like to end with this final point. But to what end? Why do we need to live by the imperishable word of God? That is living and that is abiding. If you read verse 22, it says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. For a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. There's a goal to this. There's a goal that Peter and Paul, they're both cause, I mean, calling the Christians to live by the word of God so that we could live that out in a way that is loving brothers earnestly and sincerely from a pure heart. And this is not some loving deeply or caring for them deeply. The same word earnestly is used, it's the same Greek word that is used when Jesus was praying earnestly before he was being crucified. He didn't pray casually, just, oh, Lord, just give me strength to do what I cannot do. But he prayed earnestly and sincerely to a point where his sweat drops turned to blood. And Peter is calling each and every one of us. If you are going to live a life of obedience to the truth, do that so that you love sincerely. You love one another earnestly from that purified heart from the word of God. The two things have to go hand in hand together all the time. Truth and love. I said this uh, many, many times in the past. If you only have truth and have no love, you're a Pharisee. But if you only have love and have no truth, you're a phony, right? Simple as that. We need both. We need to allow the word of God to transform us radically in a way that, okay, this imperishable word is what I'm going to live by. And what did the early Christians do? They lived a life of radical love unto one another that is sincere and that is earnest which came from a purified heart from the word of God. What is the end to our holiness? Right? All of this is in the same breath of Peter teaching the, the holiness of God, started, that, which started from verse 13. I mean, if you remember my, my message on holiness, it's not some keeping of the law, but the holiness, when we consider the holiness of God, is the fullness of God in his full glory and his full deity all of his greatest attributes in its fullest state is considered holiness and if you are called to be holy as god is holy we must live a radical life of being purified by the word of god not being defiled by the er earthly values of the world but living according to the imperishable Word of God, but to what end? To what end are you pursuing your holiness? It is so that we sincerely love our brothers and love one another earnestly. We know John 3.16 very well, but do you know 1 John 3.16? 1 John 3.16 is worth memorizing too. Let, let's read together in one voice. Ready, set, go. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. This is love. First, it comes from God laying down his life for us. It all starts there. It is that seed that is planted in us, that grows, that purifies us, that sanctifies us. It is the word of God that gives us life but it is because of his love, we are called to love God radically, but also love one another deeply, earnestly and sincerely. Peter used two adjectives, sincerely love one another and earnestly love from a pure heart. I hope you catch his heart.
If we say we, we love God but love not one another, the Bible tells us we don't know that love. We don't know that love. And if you have a hard time loving one another, I'm not sure if the love of God really means much. If we cannot live that out in a way that is fullness in us being holy, like God is being holy. God could have remained holy and stayed distant from where we are. But he did not stay distant. But he came down to where we are in love. And that's the life that Paul, that Peter, that John in this passage is calling us to live by. It may not mean endangering your lives. I'm not, I hope. I mean, if, if it comes down to that, maybe so too. Maybe we, we can jump into a, a, a running car to save somebody. That would be heroic. But can you lay down your lives for your brother? Can you lay down your pride? Can you lay down your thinking, your way of thinking? Can you lay down your, your view of things? Can you hear out that somebody by laying down yourself down with an open heart so that we love one another deeply from a pure heart so that we could all grow together. My brothers and sisters, may we love radically, sincerely, earnestly as we hold to the imperishable inheritance, imperishable blood of Jesus Christ and the imperishable word of God so that we too will be holy as God is holy.